The books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written by the Apostle Paul to the saints in Corinth. Because the church and its doctrines were relatively new in that city, it's understandable that Corinthian saints encountered some confusion. Paul had previously taught them the fundamental truth of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. But some members soon began teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead. Paul implored them to keep in memory the truths they had been taught. When we encounter conflicting opinions about gospel truths, it is good to remember that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Listening to the Lord's appointed servants and holding to the simple truths they repeatedly teach can help us find peace and stand fast in the faith. This is Hope in Christ, a Come Follow Me podcast, and I'm your host, Ben Peterson, a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 1 through 16. Hi, and thank you for joining me again for another scripture highlight from the New Testament. In today's scripture highlight, we will be pulling scriptures from all over the book of 1 Corinthians. From the very beginning of this letter to the Corinthian saints, Paul addressed the idea of unity. Now, this has been a topic addressed by prophets of probably every age. Even since the days of Adam, men and women have felt divisions and contentions with one another. But as the Savior taught the Nephites when he came and ministered to them in the Americas, his doctrine teaches that contentions should be done away with. That message has echoed throughout the annals of time. In fact, in October 2008, this particular talk has always rung in my mind. It's from President Henry B. Eyring. He said, We see increased conflict between peoples in the world around us. Those divisions and differences could infect us. That is why my message of hope today is that a great day of unity is coming. The Lord Jehovah will return to live with those who have become his people and will find them united of one heart, unified with him and with our Heavenly Father. Close quote. And most recently, President Russell M. Nelson has urged us to become peacemakers. Just like our modern-day prophets and apostles, Paul taught the early Corinthian saints that we should become one in Christ. And when you think about it, the only truly eternal constant that exists is Christ. There is no other way to become completely and eternally united. So if you're looking to build unity in your home, within a group or a ward, the best way to do it is to bring everyone together by focusing each one of them on Jesus Christ. As we become more focused on Him, we become more united together. That's quite the opposite from the message of the world, which says basically to do whatever you want to do. And where we take so much offense so easily, the world would often have us complain about things, finding fault in someone else, or why we deserve better than what we received. Thoughts like those lead to divisiveness. They do not unify. So in chapter 2, Paul emphasized Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He taught in verse 4 that we should not believe in men's wisdom or the philosophies of men, but in verse 5 he states that our faith should be in the power of God. Now throughout the book of 1 Corinthians and others, Paul repeatedly refers to some of the saints as being people who were initiated. In verse 6, the translation is that they were perfect. Now, that word perfect is actually teleos, which is a word that means initiated. In verse 7, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In other words, while the world might believe in the philosophies of men, we believe and know things that can only be understood by the Holy Ghost. A mystery a secret teaching or a, a secret rite, maybe even a sacred rite. Speaking of these mysteries was an idea that silence had been imposed by initiation into certain religious ceremonies or rites. 
It's even possible that Paul's referring to some type of temple ordinances that were performed in his day. And as we consider the sacred temple ordinances of our dispensation, when we read verses 9 through 11, it's beautiful to think about what can happen when we seek revelation in God's temple. Paul wrote, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. In other words, the deep things of God are learned by revelation, most often in the temple. Even today, there aren't any classes held in the temple, but revelation, personal revelation, is the real teacher. Now, when I go to the temple, it's important for me to remember this truth, that the teacher is the Holy Ghost. Though there are wonderful and beautiful and increasingly beautiful words as there are changes to the endowment that are spoken in the temple, the real teacher are not specifically those words, but what the Spirit teaches as we ponder those words. In verse 14, Paul powerfully wrote, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I remember going to the temple and even learning the gospel. At certain parts of my life, certain things just didn't make any sense to me. But as I have pondered, and I'm sure that the same thing has happened to you, as we ponder upon the things of God and let the Spirit speak to our minds and our hearts, we can ultimately discern the meaning and the truth behind certain teachings or symbols. That's because it takes the Spirit of the Holy Ghost to help us learn the things of God. The things of God are so much higher, so much deeper than our mortal minds can often comprehend. They're even hard sometimes to articulate once we do understand them. But our spirits can come to the point where we truly understand the things of God, and it happens as spirit speaks to spirit. Now, changing topics just a little bit, it isn't any secret that we're living today in a very sexualized society. And because of that type of influence that surrounds us in nearly everything that we see or hear, President Ezra Taft Benson, even back in 1986, said, The plaguing sin of this generation is sexual immorality. This, the prophet Joseph said, would be the source of more temptations, more buffetings, and more difficulties for the elders of Israel than any other. President Joseph F. Smith said that sexual impurity would be one of the three dangers that would threaten the church within, and so it does. It permeates our society. Perhaps more relevant than any time in the past are Paul's words to the Corinthians. In chapter 6, verse 18, he commands them to flee fornication. What, he asks, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God's. Some in our world today might ask why we're so serious about morality and chastity. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland once answered that toying with the God-given and satanically coveted body of another person toys with the very soul of that individual, toys with the central purpose and product of life, the very key to life, as Elder Boyd K. Packer once called it. In trivializing the soul of another, and please include the word body there, and I would even include looking at that body, we trivialize the atonement that saved that soul and guaranteed its continued existence. And when one toys with the Son of Righteousness, the Day Star himself, one toys with white heat and a flame hotter and holier than the noonday sun. You cannot do so and not be burned. You cannot with impunity crucify Christ afresh. Exploitation of the body, please include the word soul there, 
is an exploitation of him who is the light and the life of the world. Close quote. So remember Paul's teachings. Ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price, and so is every person on this earth that you encounter. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to him. Remember this counsel from the New for the Strength of Youth guide. Your body is an amazing gift from your Heavenly Father. He gave it to you to help you become more like Him. Having a body gives you increased power to exercise your freedom to choose. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ can help you see your body from God's perspective, and that makes a big difference in your choices about what to do with your body and how to care for it. Sexual feelings are an important part of God's plan to create happy marriages and eternal families. These feelings are not sinful. They are sacred. Because sexual feelings are so sacred and so powerful, God has given you His law of chastity to prepare you to use these feelings as He intends. The law of chastity states that God approves of sexual activity only between a man and a woman who are married. Many in the world ignore or even mock God's law, but the Lord invites us to be His disciples and live a standard higher than the world's. Keep sex and sexual feelings sacred. They shouldn't be the subject of jokes or entertainment. Outside of marriage between a man and a woman, it is wrong to touch the private sacred parts of another person's body even if clothed. In your choices about what you do, Look at, read, listen to, think about, post, or text. Avoid anything that purposely arouses lustful emotions in others or yourself. This includes pornography in any form. If you find that situations or activities make temptations stronger, avoid them. As Paul would say, flee. You know what those situations and activities are. And if you aren't sure, the Spirit Your parents and your leaders can help you know. Show your Father in heaven that you honor and respect the sacred power to create life. Don't you just love that new For the Strength of Youth guide? If you're a youth leader, young men or young woman leader, and a bishopric, an advisor, a presidency member, it might be a really, really wise idea to talk about this guide often, to even pull it out and reference it in your talks, in your conversations, in your lessons and activities. The doctrine is explained so simply and clearly in that guide. And the content of that guide is also a great reminder for every adult in the church too. The way it's worded emphasizes the use of our agency, and we'll get to agency a little bit later at the end of today's scripture highlight. But as we move on to the next portion of our highlight, I'd like to start with a question. Have you ever found yourself, when maybe when you were younger, wanting to do something, and then with a concerned look in her eye, your mother or even your father turned to you and said, that you ought to avoid even the appearance of evil? Now that line, avoid the appearance of evil, is actually a scripture that comes from the Apostle Paul, but it's not in 1 Corinthians, it's later on this year in our study. But he touches on the same topic in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You see, at the time, people were complaining because they had been commanded to not touch the food that was offered in idol worship. As they would sacrifice animals, they would then eat the animals at these sacrificial feasts. But they were sacrificing these animals to idols. And we know that false gods don't exist. And so did the early saints. So they thought perhaps because they know that the false gods aren't real, that it would be okay for them to eat at these sacrificial feasts. But Paul teaches them a couple of things. First, he talks to them about liberty. We call this sometimes today Christian liberty, the ability to choose for yourself. But he said in verse 9, be careful so that your liberty doesn't become a stumbling block to those who are weaker in the gospel. In other words, learn the principle, govern yourself It's fine for you, perhaps, to go and eat that meat at that sacrificial offering, 
But should you? What will it do to the tender testimonies of other people who are weaker or new to the gospel if they see you partaking in those sacrificial feasts that are being sacrificed to false gods? So Paul is teaching us really that charity is the eye through which we should look as we make our choices. As I go about my choices, how might my choice affect someone else? And I have to say that increasing our self-awareness to looking out at other people and how our choices might affect others or might appear to others and how that appearance could then hurt their faith is really living a higher law. It puts us in a place where our, our sights are raised. We're seeking not just our own pleasure or our own way, but really watching out for people around us with a focus on truly bringing other people closer to the Savior. Now, I do have to add one thing to this conversation. It's really important for some of us to remember not to be too hard on ourselves. It's important to not take this principle too far. For example, you don't want to second guess every single thing you do because you're so paranoid and worried that someone else might interpret it wrong or fall away from the church or be disappointed or discouraged because of your choices. So there's a right balance to strike. You'll find it. The Spirit will guide you. But we do need to be aware of how our choices might be affecting other people, particularly as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's one reason why it might be really important to focus a little bit more on the doctrine of Christ rather than the culture that we've created in the church. When we emphasize or overemphasize the culture, we start to lose Christ. And I think that incorrect emphasis can sometimes be what leads other people to want to step away from the church or take a break from the church. So we have to be careful. Focus on Christ. When you get up in sacrament meeting and fast and testimony meeting, make sure that your talk or your testimony is centered on Him and on our Heavenly Father and on their fundamental doctrine. Now let's move to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 13 is one of the greatest verses, for me at least, when I was a teenager. When I was learning the gospel and trying to find my place in this world, I found that I was being hit with temptations from every angle. And perhaps you find that maybe you're still in that situation today. If you are, if you're ever dealing with temptations, always remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That line is so great. Sometimes we probably think that we're the only one experiencing a particular temptation or situation. Sometimes we think that no one understands. We think that we're unique. And in our temptations, we're really not unique. The Lord is telling us here that what you're experiencing is is common. There are other people out there who've gone through the same thing. And he said, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted above that which you're able. But with every temptation, God will also make a way for you to escape. There is always a way out so that you can be able to bear it. That is a message of a God of love of a Father in heaven who loves us, of a Savior who loves us, who will always provide an escape route for us, allowing us to be tempted, allowing us to use our agency, giving us the choice. Do you want everlasting death or do you want eternal life? You choose. But in the end, as you're tempted, I will always allow you to get out. I will never put it on you so heavy or allow it to be put on you so heavy that you can't escape. The scripture comes to mind that says, with God, all things are possible, or I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So how do we get that power to escape temptation? Last week, we spoke a little bit about the temple garment. And in that conversation, I quoted the words that if we wear the garment faithfully throughout life, It will serve as a protection against temptation and evil. So, faithfulness to covenants is one of the best ways to avoid and overcome temptation. But another one that Paul brings up in this very chapter is the ordinance of the sacrament. The cup of blessing which we bless, he said, 
is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Remember that when you and I partake of the sacrament today, we are uniting ourselves in a covenant with God that binds us to Him, but it also binds us in love for one another. That love, that service, that reaching out, that worrying about other people's welfare and well-being, that can help us avoid temptations and evil as well. And so as we go about our day-to-day chores and the things that we do week after week, Paul reminds us that all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things don't edify. In other words, just because I can do something, does it mean that I should? We should really judge our actions on how they affect other people. Instead of seeking our own glory or our own pleasure, Paul teaches us in chapter 10, verse 31, do it all to the glory of God. And this is all to remind us that the essence of our agency, the essence of Christian liberty, is not about having the right to do whatever we want to do. It's about the responsibility to do what is right. Now, we're going to move really quickly through chapter 11, but there's two very important things I want to stop on real quick. In verse number 11, Paul teaches a very fundamental truth. He said, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Elder David A. Bednar has taught that men and women complement and complete each other in unique ways that enable them individually and as a couple to fulfill their divine potential. Because of their distinctive temperaments and capacities, males and females each bring to a marriage relationship unique perspectives and experiences. The man and the woman contribute differently but equally to a oneness and a unity that can be achieved in no other way. The man completes and perfects the woman, and the woman completes and perfects the man as they learn from and mutually strengthen and bless each other. Thus, by divine design, men and women are intended to progress together toward redemption and enduring joy. The vision of marriage presented through the doctrine of Christ as a holy order based on enduring covenants, duties, and lifelong sacrifice stands in stark contrast to a modern secular concept of marriage. That worldly formulation has virtually nothing to do with losing your life in service to family or in self-sacrifice for spouse and children. To the contrary, many in our society today are quickly turning to, as one expert termed it, a purely private, contractual model of marriage where each party has equal and reciprocal rights and duties and where two parties of whatever gender or sexual orientation have full freedom and privacy to form, maintain, and dissolve their relationship as they see fit. This is no less than a full-fledged revolution, transforming marriage into a purely social institution of free association, easily entered and easily broken, with a focus on the needs of individuals. This revolution is based on extreme conceptions of personal autonomy and individual rights that elevate one's own will over God's will, that opt for personal choice over personal responsibility, and that prioritize the desires of individuals over the needs of spouses and children. Elder Bednar continued, Never has a global society placed so much emphasis on the fulfillment of romantic and sexual desires as the highest form of personal autonomy, freedom, and self-actualization. Society has elevated sexual fulfillment to an end in itself rather than a means to a higher end. In this confusion, millions have lost the truth that God intended sexual desire to be a means to the divine ends of marital unity, the procreation of children and strong families, not a selfish end in itself. No wonder, then, that marriage has become so fragile and transient. Influenced by this increasingly pervasive ideology of self-centeredness and selfishness, 
Too often, men and women pursue relationships and marriage focused on their own needs and desires, rather than on building stable marital and family relationships. The compulsion to vindicate their freedom, rights, and autonomy overshadows a proper understanding of the enduring commitments, covenants, duties, and sacrifices necessary to build successful marriages and families, and to bring lasting joy. Given this trend, many in our culture could not long resist the call to redefine marriage from the union of a man and a woman to the union of any two people, regardless of gender. After all, if marriage is little more than a vehicle for advancing personal autonomy and individual rights, rather than a sacred and enduring union between man and woman centered on self-sacrifice and raising a family, then it becomes very hard to deny marriage, any type of marriage, to any couple or group of people that seek it. In marriage and family life, we learn and grow together as God intended. In our families, we cannot hide from who we really are as we strive to become who we're destined to become. In essence, a family is the mirror that helps us become aware of imperfections and flaws we may not be able or want to acknowledge. No one knows us better than a spouse and the other members of our family. Thus, the family is the ultimate mortal laboratory for the improving and perfecting of God's children. In marriage and family, we can experience profound loyalty, pure love, and consummate joy. We learn in a deeply personal way about God's love for each of us. He closes, To paraphrase what Jesus Christ taught as we lose ourselves in service to spouse and family, we find our true selves. Every day we become more of who He wants us to become. And that is the source of enduring joy and true self-fulfillment. Close quote. That was a long quote, but I didn't feel comfortable passing over such a profound doctrine without pausing and hearing some words from a prophet of God. The other part of chapter 11 I'd like to highlight is in verses 24 to 28. This is actually the earliest account we have of the sacrament ordinance. It predates the gospel accounts of the sacrament by about 15 years. Paul said, When he had given thanks, speaking of Jesus, he took the bread and break it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. That verse, verse 26, that line that every time we take the sacrament, we show the Lord's death until he comes, is significant to me. That word show, another translation is to proclaim his death or announce his death. For me, when I look at sacrament meeting, I think it's very accurate to say that that meeting is a memorial service to the Savior. If you were invited to show or announce his death, to have a memorial service for the Savior, how early would you arrive? Where would you sit? How would you act before the service began? What would your thoughts be turned to during that service? If you were asked to speak at that memorial service, what would be the focus of your talk? What would you emphasize? What words do you feel would be most fitting for your prayer? My friends, I submit to you that every Sabbath day, we are invited to show the Lord's death. We're invited to memorialize Him. We're invited to that memorial service where deacons, teachers, and priests, young men, act as pallbearers, providing us the opportunity to partake of the emblems of Christ's sacrament. As they carry the emblems of the blood and body of Christ to their final resting place, the souls of all those who partake of them. So that we can be filled with His Spirit, 
so that we can always have His Spirit to be with us. And so, as Paul calls on us to not partake of the sacrament unworthily, we might also consider not partaking of the sacrament unprepared. You might have noticed about three years ago a change or two in the interview questions for a temple recommend. One of those changes, which is one of my favorite changes, was the addition of a few words that say, do you prepare for and worthily partake of the sacrament? My friends, we ought not to come to the sacrament table unprepared. We have six days to prepare for the sacrament ordinance and the Sabbath wherein we partake of that ordinance. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for the memorial service of the Savior, to participate in that memorial service, and to partake of the emblems of His death? A death that took place for me and for you. A death that allowed our sins, which He had taken upon Himself in flesh and blood, to die forever with His body on the cross. The more we come to the sacrament table prepared, with a broken or repentant heart and a contrite or willingly obedient spirit, we will walk away truly nourished, truly filled with His Spirit, ready to conquer the next week, with power to overcome the world, power to overcome our temptations, sight to see clearly through the mists of darkness that surround us. Life is always better on Monday morning, when we've kept the Sabbath sacred day holy, and when we've prepared and partaken of the sacrament ordinance. Now, we're moving into the last chapters of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 13 is Paul's great talk about charity. There is so much we could say about charity, and so much has been said about charity. So many great talks from prophets expound on this principle, this gift of charity. I'd like to share just a few thoughts. This gift of charity is the spiritual gift that perhaps ought to be sought for above all others. Charity is the relationship of love between God and man. The great symbol and embodiment of charity is Jesus Christ himself. Charity suffereth long. Jesus Christ has suffered long. He has so much patience with you. He sees what is possible in you, and he never gives up on you. Charity envieth not. Jesus Christ does not envy the Father's glory. He does everything the Father's way, and he doesn't go off on his own way ever. Charity thinketh no evil. Satan thought that there was nothing in us, nothing good could come of us. Jesus looks at us with faith and hope and sees only the good in us. Charity beareth all things. Jesus Christ bore even your sins. Charity never faileth. With Jesus Christ, serving never gets old. It's always new. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning of this Scripture Highlight episode, many people in Corinth had begun teaching and even believing that there was no resurrection from the dead, despite all the evidences that they had seen and had of Christ's resurrection, they began to believe that it was no longer a reality. Paul emphatically corrected that misconception by emphasizing that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. And then to drive this point home, he said to them, If Christ had not risen from the dead, then our preaching is for nothing. Your faith is for nothing. If there is no resurrection, if Christ doesn't live, then there is no reason to do anything that we're doing as Christians. If Christ hasn't risen from the dead, there is absolutely no hope for anyone, even for those who have already died. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, Paul said. Now let's pause here and ask a question. Have you ever wondered if you will make it to the celestial kingdom? Have you ever wondered if you are going to be good enough to make it into heaven? What will win in the end? Will it be heaven 
or hell? There are scriptures that talk about both, but where will we end up? When you think about that question, you don't have to think too long. In Moses chapter 1, verse 39, we learn that Heavenly Father's work and glory, the work and glory of Almighty God, is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Don't ever underestimate the power of God to fulfill His work and glory. It's not wishful thinking. It is His every intent to do it, to save us in the highest glory possible. He's not in the business of bringing about punishment or inflicting sorrow or damnation on His children. Don't ever undermine the power of the love of God. For as in Adam all die, Paul said, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. As a free gift, well, free for us, Christ paid the price for that gift. All of us who chose to come to earth to be a part of God's plan will rise again. Every man, woman, and child on this earth will resurrect. When we talk about hell in a permanent sense, we're really speaking about outer darkness, where only the sons of perdition will go. And when you read about outer darkness and the sons of perdition and those who will inherit hell forever, it sounds like a pretty limited group to me. You can read more about it in section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Verse 37 states that they're the only ones upon whom the second death will have power, the only ones who will be forever cut off from God. That sounds like a pretty limited group to me. Through His atonement, Jesus Christ will save everyone else, except for those who've become smart enough to become sons of perdition. Smart enough in the sense that they have come to know God in a very personal sense, but foolish because after coming to a perfect knowledge of God, they will have chosen to walk away from Him forever. But everyone else, all the rest of God's children, the valiant, the righteous, the faithful, the good, and even the wicked, will be received into heaven. Even the telestial glory, a place where murderers will go, is better than this earth. All kingdoms of heaven are heaven. In the end, who wins? God wins. Heaven wins. And as Paul taught, in heaven there are different types of bodies, there are different kingdoms, different glories, different powers, different abilities given to God's children. And they're dependent upon the laws by which we choose to abide in the flesh, in this life. If we choose to abide a telestial law, we will inherit a telestial glory with telestial power. If we're willing to abide a higher law, the terrestrial laws, then we will abide a terrestrial power. We'll receive a terrestrial world, a terrestrial body with terrestrial abilities. But Heavenly Father's children who are valiant in the testimony of Jesus, they don't pick and choose the commandments. They're not perfect, but they become perfect, not by their own efforts and not because of their repentance, but because of their faith and willingness to repent and follow Christ. It's because of Him that they eventually become perfect. If we are standing on God's covenant path, facing Him and moving at whatever speed we can muster, we have nothing to worry about. If your weaknesses find you falling into the same sins over and over again, it doesn't matter as long as you never give up on faith and repentance. The Lord sees us in our weakness. He allowed our weakness. And if we strive every day, if you never give up, one day, over time, you will find that the Lord has changed you. Incrementally and iteratively, you will become better and better and better until you shine as bright as He does. Now, that might not happen in this life, but it will happen because the promise is that you will be washed 
and cleansed from your sins, you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will eventually become sealed His. You will eventually overcome because of your unrelenting faith in Jesus Christ, never giving up, never forgetting that He has not forgotten you. If we turn to Him, even if we've given up in the past, if we return and come back, if we never give up on our hope in Him, never give up on our faith in Him, strengthen our covenant relationship with Him, the day will come when you will dwell in the presence of God and His Christ forever and ever. President Russell M. Nelson taught, Mortal lifetime is barely a nanosecond compared with eternity. But what a crucial nanosecond it is. Consider carefully how it works. During this mortal life, you get to choose which laws you are willing to obey. Those of the celestial kingdom, or the terrestrial, or the telestial. And therefore, in which kingdom of glory you will live forever. Close quote. Isn't it amazing that Heavenly Father's plan is a plan that totally and completely honors your agency? You get to choose where you go. No longer do we have to ask the question, I wonder where I'll be. Will I be good enough for heaven? The answer is no. None of us are good enough for heaven. None of us ever will be good enough for heaven on our own. But that is why through covenants we bind ourselves to Christ. If we can become joint heirs with him, choosing to live his law, choosing to have faith, choosing to repent every single day and to let God prevail in our life, then we will have chosen to live in the celestial kingdom. My friends, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel of change. It's a gospel of hope. It's a gospel of change and hope in Christ.